In this video, I am venturing into uncharted territory by exploring the psyche of the legendary Cliff Harris. I'm talking softly because number 43 will get mad if he hears this. The boogeyman of the NFL. But that helmet on his head covers a rapidly balding dome for Cliff Harris, the former free agent from Washita Baptist. Perhaps a loss of hair is reflected in his continuing battle for a starting spot in the defensive backfield with his good friend Charlie Waters. Cliff Harris has been retired from the gridiron since 1979. Uh, he's Cliff Harris, the hard-hitting free safety of the Dallas Cowboys from... Washita Baptist University, the fighting Tigers of Washita Baptist University. If you trust in God and make the right choices, you will succeed. You'll make it to your own Hall of Fame, whatever that might be. But on the field in his playing days, he was a football maniac, a football monster that instilled fear in other football players. Causing sleepless nights before game day. I have witnessed numerous highlights of the incredible Cliff Harris, the interceptions. The guy from Washita College. The vicious hits, the psychotic fights. Throw it all over the place and we got a free for all. The game changing plays, Super Bowls, championships. The only coach the Cowboys have ever had. I have often debated his greatness on this channel, but has anyone ever delved into his mind to evaluate it psychologically? Cliff Harris was a free agent of the Cowboys in 1970. You know, I was told I'd be and uh, was going to be drafted, but I ended up as a free agent. How do you feel about your chances of making the ball club now? Well, uh, judging from uh, what they, what Dallas has got coming back and, and the defensive backs, uh, the opportunity lies in the defensive, one defensive back position. I feel that if I can do the, the, an adequate job at defensive back, that my chances are real good. Thus far, Cliff has held the upper hand, but here in training camp for their third year, the two of them are at it again. He's got to beat me out, that's the way I look at it, and I don't plan for that to happen, and uh, I mean, it's his thoughts that way, you know, uh, and not mine. As an athlete, Landry used him in a variety of ways. He ran kickoff returns, occasionally played cornerback, ran back punts, but it was at safety where he received the nickname Captain Crash from the legendary Dave Edwards. Harris's bone-chilling hits was oftentimes heard in the bleachers. Oftentimes he would break his teammates' bones literally or knock them flat out. And I'm not exaggerating. He called his teammates collateral damage. Hardest hit I got in my whole career was Cliff on a slant route. And I remember the defense we were in was a double team on the slant routes, and I read the play perfectly. And it's cut in front of me for an interception, and the next thing I know, they were carrying me off the field. It just knocked me slap out, and he just loved it. Well, I read it perfectly, too. Well, you know, and we were both went for it. I'm surprised you didn't deck me on the way in, man. <laughs> You used to deck me all the time in practice. People used to say, Drew, was the hardest hit you ever had? It was a Thursday practice when we were getting ready to play the Washington no Redskins. I come over the middle giving you the defense a, pic a picture, yeah. and you just laid me out, and I'm laying uh, on the turf, wallowing in pain. Oh, no. You know what Coach Landry said? <laughs> Move the drill up. We got work to do. <laughs> but Harris was much more than a football monster. He was a calculated monster. Harris was a football genius who was obsessed with game film. He would analyze everything, like how he analyzed in his mind over and over again how Roger Starbuck owed him his share of glory in the infamous Hail Mary play against the Vikings in the 70s. I was about on the you know, 15 yard line, 20 yard line in that range. And he came down, got right in my face, and the ball was right there uh, behind him. So I, I stepped up to bump into him well, he dodged me, <laughs> and the ball hit right on, in front of me and bounced careened to my my right. There was a big scramble because my, the team thought that it hit me. It didn't hit me. We tried to uh, recover it, uh, and they fumbled. And Minnesota got the ball back, and it was on the five-yard line or ten-yard line or something. They scored on the next play. And they take a six to nothing lead as Foreman who had 22 touchdowns in the regular season. So the way I look at this is, a new perspective of this, is so they started out with a seven point lead on us. And you know that seven point lead and then turned out to be a three point lead. Well, I hadn't done that play. Drew would have never had the Hail Mary and Roger would never have had that play because we would have been ahead at that time. So I take 
some credit for that. He got it! Touchdown! Cliff Harris was the quarterback of the flex defense. Tom Landry wanted all of his players to know the tendencies of the opposite side of the ball. In a news article written by WFAA, a TV channel in Dallas, Texas, Leroy Jordan said, at the free safety spot, you had to be in tune with the middle linebacker, both corners and all of the team members. Harris being the quarterback of the flex defense, this definitely applied to him. You had to be smart to play free safety in Landry's system. He had to learn every intricate detail of each position, where they were supposed to line up and what their duties were. So Cliff had to learn the positions, their responsibilities, their technique, and how to react. This week you go against a team that primarily uh, goes with the rollout pass, uh, play action for the most part. What the difference does that present to you compared to a guy like Snead? Well, uh, it really wasn't uh, Snead so much, but it was the motion of the backs and the and the and the line, you know the and the receivers, all the motion back there. The quarterback doesn't pose that much of a problem. Personally, I like the rollout type quarterback better. Uh, a drop back, I mean, you can, I mean, uh, you can play his strengths, you know, against his weaknesses, and it's a little easier for us. And uh, I play against a standard uh, type offense. I guess you're, what you're saying, in effect, is when he rolls, you pretty well know which side he's going to throw the ball. Well, naturally, you know, he's going to be, it'll be stronger to the side he rolls to. Actually, it's just not, it's a half roll. But the side he rolls to, he'll be stronger there in that area and weaker back on the weak side. So we'll know more where to play. Klein is 235 and he and Harris met earlier and Harris wanted and this time Klein must think that 43 is chasing him around on purpose. So Cliff had a big job and he filled it well. Leroy Jordan confirmed this in the same article. He studied and was knowledgeable about all the positions and was able to help other players to make sure they were in the right position on defense too. He was a very studious guy as far as the game was concerned. Harris had to understand the run philosophy of the team that he was going up against on Sundays. He was also instructed to direct his teammates. Defensive backs had to understand what the run philosophy was. White elaborated. They also had to understand because they were either going to be a contained man or a cut by guy when they were running the plays around the end. You always had three guys at the point of attack, and one guy always had to contain. In the article, Charlie Waters called him a worry wart. The Cowboys had these computerized printouts of all their opponents' game stats from at least six games previous. According to Waters in the article, they even had printouts of the six previous games that Dallas played against that opponent. These books were big, like encyclopedia B. It was 14 by 18 inch books on continuous paper. Harris was absolutely obsessed with analyzing these books. He would stay up late into the night, sometimes even past midnight studying them. Waters found Harris's dedication overwhelming. It got to the point where Waters had to ask Harris to stop studying. He would analyze everything to the point where I would say, okay Cliff, stop. You just need to stop right there because we don't need anything other than this point. We don't need to go further than this. That's truly impressive. Waters himself was no mere lab rat, so for him to tell Harris to take a break, it must have meant that Harris had taken it to the extreme. It made sense though, considering he majored in math and in physics. He would study each paper of this encyclopedia down to the details. He would look into it so in depth that this computer would spit out a report like a big massive encyclopedia every week that was telltale. He would go as far as calculating the precise area on the field where the player would be and position himself perfectly to collide with him. They come into my territory, <laughs> they're going to pay a price. protection for Archie oh, for Childs. Yeah. He hit him and Harris hit shot. And Muskie manages to retain his balance but does not get from behind. Blocked by Upchurch. He fumbled. Aaron Kyle. And Hayden throws down the middle for Bob Klein. Cliff Harris made the hit. Before each play, he would contemplate whether he should knock a player out of the game or intercept the ball, as Harris believed that each action would have different long-lasting results. If he chose to knock out a player instead of intercepting the pass, he would influence the receiver's choice to catch the ball over the middle in future games, ultimately altering game plans and strategies. Billy Waddy, when we were playing the Rams in Texas Stadium, and um he ran a post route, and I was a half the field, and I came from the other direction, and he didn't see me coming, and I would have probably been 
you know, in today's world, not only injected, but fined, <laughs> but thrown in jail. <laughs> I don't even feel bad about that because he was laid out there, but he got up and he didn't know where he was, but uh, he was better after the next week. But the guys that were watching the film on the team, the Washington Redskins that were going to play the next week, saw that. And they knew that if they ran into that same area, same thing was going to happen. So it was all a psychological game, with it, you know. And I would tell those guys, hey, don't run in this area. You know, the same thing that happened to Billy. Instead of sending players over the middle, they would switch it up and throw outs and fade routes, which Harris would always be prepared for. Other times he would go for the interception, especially if he knew that it could change the game. For well, White. With Harris. And he'll stay down. Now watch it change. And you'll see the rest of the play from behind Fran. And watch Barnes make the play. And there's Harris. Arkansas again goes deep. Throwing deep. Picked off back with Harris. His second interception of the day. All right. Fran Tarkington throwing from deep in his own territory. And they've been flirting with disaster down here the entire quarter. And the guy from Washington College. As the quarterback of the flex defense, Harris had a strong passion for studying and understanding quarterbacks both on and off the field. Like a psychologist, he delved deep into their minds, learning about their tendencies, preferences, and how they handle different situations. My job was to understand quarterbacks, not only the percentages of where they threw and how they threw, but how they thought and how their psychology was, how you beat them mentally. Harris even went beyond their football abilities and tried to comprehend them as individuals, exploring their desires, ambitions, and motivations. How do you understand them as a person? What are they really after? Are they really after the glory of winning the game by throwing long passes like Tony Romo or like throwing the long pass and being a winner or a strategic quarterback that throws, analyzes the defenses and threads their way down the field? I know this sounds like some mad scientist experience exploring every intricate detail of the human anatomy. But Harris's evil plot gets worse. While many players use the Pro Bowl as an opportunity to socialize with fellow athletes, Harris saw it as a valuable chance to further his understanding of quarterbacks. It became his personal hunting ground, where he carefully observed and analyzed their tendencies, habits, and vulnerabilities. Opposing offenses focused their game plan around Harris, and Harris relished in it. It transformed into a strategic chess match. He yearned not only to delve into the quarterback psyche, but to engage in an outright battle with the entire offense, including the offensive coordinator and control coaches who aided in plotting his downfall. Look at the Dallas versus Cardinals game in 1978. Earlier in the game, Hart beat Harris on a pretty deep pass. They tried to go back to that same play later in the game, and Harris made them pay for it. On the side of Melgrave, intercepted, intercepted at the 44-yard line. Cliff Harris got it. Cliff Harris intercepted. Pass is intended for Melgrave. Cowboys get it back first and then at the 44. 10 seconds left. I tell you, don't go away, folks. We might be playing another five minutes for the last ten seconds. What Harris had such a brilliant mind that you couldn't do the same play twice on him. You can tell he was anticipating the throw before it happened. Few players in the 70s possessed the athleticism for that interception, but rarely anyone had the foresight to anticipate the play in its direction like Harris did. Harris thrived on leveraging any kind of advantage, particularly when faced with doubt from others to gain a competitive edge. One time the president Nixon said that Miami was going to be Dallas in the Super Bowl because Dallas couldn't stop Paul Warfield inside passes. Well, Harris took offense to this because he was the one in charge of stopping inside routes. Like a prepared strategist, Harris studied film on Warfield for hours on into the night. Paul Warfield had four receptions and just 39 yards receiving. The 
double coverage on Warfield, which is what we expected. Then throws 20, Harris is 43. Leroy Jordan. 55 also back in the picture right there. Dallas blew out the Dolphins en route to winning their first Super Bowl in history. The only coach the Cowboys have ever had. Harris's dedication to being the best makes sense. His father was a fighter pilot in the Pacific Theater during World War II. He crashed in the ocean and survived two days on a life raft. Harris wasn't just a bruiser, he was a survivor. And just like his father, he was able to adapt to any environment. In Super Bowl 13, Harris had analyzed for week's Pittsburgh game plan. Hello everyone, Dick Enberg high atop the roof of the Orange Bowl. Welcome to Super Bowl 13. The game was simple and forthright. Though to the open guy, Bradshaw didn't read defenses and Harris knew that. Unfortunately, the great Landry didn't. Landry made his game plan too complex. Landry wanted to disguise coverages and rely on the Cowboys secondary to blanket all of Bradshaw's options to where the defense would create coverage sacks. We're going to see a lot of play action because Dallas does not get a quick pass rush out of that flex defense. But this didn't affect Bradshaw because he wasn't reading defenses. Now looking in the backfield, he was just untouched. As you see, Terry saw him so far open, he just lobbed the ball out here. Everybody's in pursuit. So in the middle of Super Bowl 13, Harris pleaded for Dallas to go back to simplifying the defense. Landry did it, and it worked just like Harris predicted. In the first half, Bradshaw had seven incompletions out of 18 attempts for 243 yards and three touchdowns. In the second half, Bradshaw went six for 12 for 75 yards and a touchdown. I've had the opportunity to connect with numerous Cowboys fans who have had the pleasure of meeting Harris over the years. It is overwhelmingly evident that the general consensus is that he is truly one of the kindest and most compassionate individuals one can ever encounter. This notion remains true to this day. Harris has not only been an exceptional teammate, but also an outstanding father and husband. Above all, an extraordinary human being. However, when it comes to his own field performance, there is no denying he was a terror and a legend who helped define a generation. Until next time, make sure to like and subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching.